I can't get enough. Got a space in my tackle box, just got to fill it up. More love, I can't ever stop. Don't got a basement, got an underground tackle shop. I am Lucy, the Lorematic Computer. Welcome to the Lure Love Podcast with your hosts, John, Crappy Hippie King, and Tim, Tackle Box Beat. Hey Lucy, do you know the year Mystery Tackle Box started? I know everything. Mystery Tackle Box started in 2012. It is the original monthly Lure subscription service. Since 2012 they've shipped 5,214,772 boxes. Correction, 773 boxes. Sorry, 774. 75. 76. These things are sailing off the shelves. They have regular, pro, and elite level boxes, with the ability to pick your fish species too. Over the years, Mystery Tackle Box has featured more than a hundred different brands in their boxes. They are often described as, Christmas every month, because you get a new box of lures each month. New lures every month? I like the sound of that. Tim, why do you ask about Mystery Tackle Box? Well, Lucy, I recently chatted with Matt Kostowski, who's the general manager of Core Brands at Ketchco. They're the owners of Mystery Tackle Box. Matt actually worked for Mystery Tackle Box in its early days. He's from Evanston, Illinois, and fished competitively on his college team at Northwestern University. In 16 events in the Abu Garcia College Fishing Central Conference, he finished in the top 10 six times including a first place finish on Lake Kincaid. I got in touch with him because I was so impressed with the contents of the juggernaut bass fishing case. And we chatted about Ketchco, how they design and test new lures and more. Ketchco's influencer marketing coordinator is sending us the gear. Influencers? You two are considered influencers? Well, why, yes, my chrome chassis friend. Our listeners, the very astute and discerning Lure Love Legion, tunes in every episode to learn the latest and the greatest in lure news as well as a little history of the great lures of yesteryear if you say so i always thought i was the influencer of our triumvirate now you are lucy you are i mean you're one of the best influences in my life i mean like you're always telling me not to eat french fries off the ground and stuff like that and our listeners they're just crazy over you now lucy we just couldn't do it without you so true Do you know the etymology of the word influencer? Uh, no, but I might if you told me what entomology means. Etymology means a word's origin. For example, the word angle, as in to fish with a hook, has its roots in the word bend, as in the bend of a fish hook, an angle. Very interesting. And let's see, the entomology of the word influencer? Influencer is a late 14th century astrological term meaning streaming ethereal power from the stars that act upon character or the destiny of men. Whoa! It can also mean a flow of water. Whoa! There you have it. Ketchko obviously believes that the two of you possess ethereal power that can change the destiny of anglers. Whoa! As fishing influencers, it might be useful for you to say something other than, whoa. Uh, Quick, Tim, say something important. Uh, 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 no, 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 more important than that. Uh, 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 Okay, I've got it. He's got it. He's got it. He's got it. What is it? When I was talking with Matt, he shared some fascinating lure research about mystery tackle box. I forgot that I wanted to talk with you about it. All right. Influence away, buddy. Matt told me in the early days of mystery tackle box, they tested regional tackle box items that included baits targeted to your region, not just to panfish or or bass or other species. Hmm, that is kind of interesting. But what they found was that customers didn't like the regional lures as much as the lures they included in all the mystery tackle boxes. Ooh, okay, so there's a mystery to the mystery tackle boxes. Mind telling us about it? What Matt told me was that the type of water being fished was more important to most anglers than the regional focus. So, for instance, an angler in Texas who primarily fished ponds had a lot in common with an angler from Maine who primarily fished ponds. So, John, what do you think about that? Well, I think it's really cool observation. I mean, I can see 
you know, how it would work that way because the Texas angler and the angler from Maine, they both, for example, go for black bass, although Maine has some largies. Uh, it's mainly a smallmouth place. Uh, the Texas angler, uh, once again, you know, fishing for the largemouth. So they're both fishing a similar size body of water. And so that in itself kind of makes, you know, their basic needs the same. Probably a lot shallower water than a big lake, uh, limited structure. That's a good point. So, for instance, what I hear you saying is if you're fishing a pond, you're probably not fishing a pond that's 200 feet deep. Whereas if you're used to fishing deep lakes, you might have lures that you need to get down that deep. So the the depth, the size of the prey and other factors could be pretty similar in ponds. Now, maybe it's a different kind of uh, salamander in Texas than in Maine, but there might be a salamander of a similar size in both of those ponds that the bass are eating. We're all connected by nature. And uh, I know one thing's in both places is cross, for example. So you were fishing for smallies in Maine. You're going to have a crawfish imitation. You might have a slightly different one down in Texas, but you both understand you need a craw bait in the box. And I think you've probably had this experience, John. If you go to a new body of water, but that body of water feels similar to things you've already fished, you know, kind of you can use the same technique. So if you're fishing in a river, and you know where the holes typically are in a river. You know how the bends work, where the, where the structure is behind rocks and things. You can use that past knowledge for that. But if you go to a body of water that you've never fished, if you've never been deep sea fishing before, you might not have any idea. Well, how, do, how does this work? How would you even find the fish? Like when I went with Clay Groves from the Fish Nerds podcast and we went fishing for lake trout, well, I would never trolled that deep. I was kind of out of my league as far as, well, how, what type of tackle do you use? How do the fish hit and everything? Whereas if we had fished in, in uh, if we were fishing in creeks or streams or, or ponds or things like that, I would have been much more at home. So I think he's on, Matt is onto something as far as this body of water and what lures you use, but also just how comfortable you are on it. The type of water you're fishing is important. So is the species and size of fish. Often fish of the same approximate size go after similar lures. Have you had this experience? Well, heck yes, Lucy. I think all anglers have had that experience. You know, it makes perfect sense because often predator fish share forage preferences, okay? So like on my side of the Mississippi drainage, the lakes and reservoirs depend largely on gizzard shad or threadfin shad for up to, it could be up to 80 to 90% of the forage base in a lake. Therefore, all the game fish present eat them. Therefore, you better have some shad imitations of different kinds and different colors when you go out on these waters. John, and I've even seen this happen for me going from freshwater to saltwater. So when I was a kid and we would spend the summers on Cape Cod, one of the fish I loved to fish for were snapper bluefish, which are just baby bluefish. And, you know, they're not that big. They're, you know, uh, 12 to 16 inches. It was a lot like fishing for trout or anything else. And I would actually use the same freshwater lures, spinners and things like that, small jigs, you know, rapalas that were three inches long on my freshwater gear because they were going after about the same size bait fish. And I was very successful with that. You didn't need saltwater gear for it because the size of the fish was about the same. You know, that just sounds so fun just hearing it. I've always wanted to do something like that because I've never been one of these people who just, oh, I got to go to saltwater. That means I got to catch something in the triple digits. It's like, no, 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 no. Just get me on my finesse tackle on a jetty where there's a bunch of those snappers running around and I could stand there all day having a ball. I really, really could. It just sounds amazing. So yeah, it's just a forage match. I mean, that's how you figure out what size bait you're going to use. Yeah. The same thing is true for fishing for mackerel. One thing I get in mind, though, is that fish have different specifics as to how their eyes process light rays. And it seems that they can prefer baits that are in the same profile, the same look, but they've got to have some different colors. Let's take a shad imitation since we're talking about lakes that are clear full of shad. So I got a shad imitation hard bait. Let's say it's just a seven-me deep diver, say uh, 2.75 inches. And let's say we're on a lake like we have around here in Kansas with whites, walleye, largemouth, and say crappies. All right, so here where I'm at, red is a major color for black bass and crappie too, but not so much for walleye. Walleye would rather have orange, and, and then, of course, bass and crappie will hit orange too. And then, like, fluorescent yellow is a dynamite color for whites and wipers, but plain white is awesome, and so is silver. 
And all these fish I mentioned, they love that chartreuse. Although when one fishes for walleye, see guys tend to want to pair it with blue, a blue backstripe or something, you know. So you see what I'm talking about, about tuning in on them. I like hanging out with you, man. You make my three dozen two-inch lipless cranks and 17 color combos from gray and black and white and red with heavy doses of color and pattern in between really make sense. You make it sound like I'm smart to have all these lures in my tackle box. But since I don't like to haul around my entire tackle world, especially when I'm I'm wading and on foot, part of the fun is using my fishing knowledge to curate a small box of what I feel will be the best baits with the biggest chance of success on every given day. And I do that for every body of water that I go out to. You know, sitting here chatting like this, it really does hit my mind that a lot of my boxes aren't organized like a jig box or one eighth ounce jig box or this sort of box and a spinnerbait box or what have you, you know, although I do have those, but I have, you know, a white bass box for instance, for going up and doing the creeks. I got uh, a pond box number one. I have a pond box number two for, you know, this one pond over here has bigger fish in it. So, uh, you know, I definitely want a box. I'm going to sacrifice a few slots so I can have two or three bigger baits in there. And so, yeah, that's exactly, you know, how you go about it. And that's exactly, you know, the fun of thinking, oh, I'm going to go here, maybe over here today. So I better have this, this, and this for sure. And then a few baits just in case, you know what I'm talking about. What lures did Catchco send you to review? I know from monitoring your email accounts that each of you had a recent mail delivery. We each just got a box from Catchco with all sorts of awesome plastic baits inside. Now, I just had a chance to open mine and have a look. I have not had a chance to fish with any of it yet, but it sure looks good in there. Well, what was your your knee-jerk first reaction from what you saw in there? What really attracted you as an angler? Oh, man, it was that biospawn vile minnow in Gobi Smoke, dude. Man, that caught me good. What was your initial favorite, Tim? John, I think yeah. one of my favorites in the box is the um, the Biospawn Vial Tube, a three and a half inch tube jig. Now, I've not used a tube jig in decades, but those used to be one of my favorite things. And these are big tube plastics. And so I'm really interested to see how these things work out. And uh, I'm sure we'll feature more catch code baits in the future. In the meantime, you can go to shopcarls.com to see what's new. You too may just possess the ethereal power to change the destiny of anglers after all. At least you've made me want to buy some of those catch code baits. John, do you ever display your lures, you know, either new ones or vintage ones, just so that you can see them better on a wall or a shelf? Oh, I sure do. It's nice to show them off. Do you have any special ways that you display them? I know some people use those small, clear acrylic stands, for example. Well, you know, room is at a premium in this house, so I display mine mainly on the walls. So Kathy will take a cool old frame that she's picked somewhere, and then she'll frame up some burlap, or she'll do some burlap with some chicken wire laying over the top of it. And then I just have a lure I come across and I want to keep. Well, I'll just walk over and I can hang it in that frame. Now, you know, uh, my daughter's grown up, move away, and we don't have any grandkids running around here yet. So this is kind of an open display. Uh, If you've got kids or pets, you want to make sure and keep it up keep it up high that chicken wire is a great idea because that's very easy to put the hook right through and hang wherever you want it on that board i hadn't thought of that so what is it that you like to use tim well i use some of those clear acrylic stands i like those the lures look good on them but they take up a lot of space on counters and tabletops and a few months ago i saw what I thought was a really ingenious way to display your lures that makes them more prominent and it's pretty cost effective. All right. What was it? Well, have you ever seen a souvenir spoon? Oh, heck yes. You know, that's our generation, the souvenir spoons. My mom had a whole collection of state spoons. Let me elucidate. A souvenir spoon is a decorative spoon used as a memento of a place or to display as a trophy of having visited there. The spoons may be made from a number of different materials such as sterling silver, nickel, or steel. They are often hung on a spoon rack and are typically ornamental, depicting sights, coat of arms, or associated characters. The year the spoon was made may be inscribed in the bowl or on the back. The first souvenir spoons in the United States were made in 1890 by Galt and Brothers of Washington, D.C. It featured the profile of George Washington. A year later, a souvenir Salem witch spoon was made and sold 7,000 copies. 
It was created by Daniel Lowe, a jeweler in Salem, Massachusetts, after he saw souvenir spoons while on vacation in Germany. The witch spoon is given credit for starting the souvenir spoon hobby in the United States. When I was growing up, there was a large silver company in our town that made spoons. So a lot of people collected them. We had a wooden spoon rack on the wall in our kitchen, and the rack could hold about 20 spoons or so. It was made of a flat piece of ornamental wood. So it was kind of like, it wasn't just square. It was kind of cut out in a, a design and it laid flat against the wall. And off the front of the, this board were several thin pieces of wood with notches in them. And you could just hang the spoons in there. So the bowl of the spoon was at the top with the handle hanging downwards and gravity just kept the spoons in place. So you're using a spoon rack to hang lures. That's pure genius. Exactly. And it's not my idea. I saw this on Facebook in a group, but it was a, it's a cool way to display your lures. Now you can simply hang the spoon rack on your wall and you can put a lure in each of those spoon slots. If a lure has a treble hook at the back, you can just kind of hang it right in the slot. If it's a single hook, it, it uh, works. If you want, you can even push that hook slightly into the wood just to make sure that it's, it's more secure. Yeah, that is really cool. I'm telling you, brother, I come across spoon racks all the time at auctions and such when I go picking with cash. You can find quite a few of them on eBay, too, and the price isn't a lot. They're like 5 to $20 each. I bought two identical ones, so they're the same shape, and they have 18 slots in each, so I can display 36 lures. While the wood stain looked okay with the lures, I wanted to make the lures pop a little bit, so I bought some matte white craft paint, and I painted the racks. And then I bought some really thin cork. It was kind of in a strip. And I put a layer of that cork on the top of each row so the hooks can penetrate that instead of the wood. And uh, it looks pretty good that that white, matte white with most of those lure colors. And you have to think about what lure colors, but if you're dealing with darker lures, they pop right off that rack. Man, that sounds like a great repurpose idea. I love this kind of stuff. I mean, one of these days, we're going to have to make some videos celebrating our creative adaptations of ordinary objects to fishing lure relevance. Yeah, I don't think people collect spoons quite as much. So there's a lot of these racks, as you said, John, that used to be a really common thing to, uh, to collect. And listeners, if you'd like to share how you display your lures, click on the microphone button on our website at www.lurelovepodcast.com and share a message with us or go to our Facebook page and share a photo with us. John, remember when we talked about the history of the Suic company and their legendary musky bait, the Suic Thriller? Oh, I sure do. The Suic Thriller is a jerk bait that is constructed with the metal lip on the rear, not the front, as in traditional jerk baits. Thrillers are made of wood or high-impact plastic. They come in many colors, have sinking and floating versions, and come in five sizes from four and a half inches to 12 inches. So tell me again now, refresh me, how does the metal lip work exactly on a Suic Thriller, Tim? The metal lip is at the back of the bait, and it's flat when you take it out of the box. You can bend it with your fingers, either into a V, or you can use pliers to bend it too. And if you bend the entire lip upwards, you get a sharper dive when you jerk the lure. So, and uh, if you bend it downwards, just the opposite. If you bend it into a cup, you get kind of more of a shimmy to the lure when you jerk it. And you can even adjust the eyelet where you attach the leader to change the action. The Suic Thriller gives you a lot of different tuning options to change the action. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now I'm remembering. That's right. It's all coming back to me. And remember that there's a four and a half inch Suic Thriller that is all plastic without a metal lip at the back. It actually has a piece of plastic that kind of looks like the metal lip, but you can't bend it at all. But overall, it has similar action. And I had sold some musky lures to a local angler, and he told me he had some of these four and a half inch thrillers, and he was happy to give me one. Ah, the kindness of strangers. Is a stranger who is an angler called a strangler? No, Lucy, we are not calling anyone a strangler. Besides, anglers are all from the same tribe. There are no strangers when it comes to fishing. And I gave him a Lure Love podcast hat, just like the ones you can order from our website. So tell me, how does that four and a half inch Suic Thriller fish? Oh, it is a great little bait. It's very thin and it has some fantastic action. But the real reason I'm sharing the story is that when he gave me the lure, 
He said, if I wanted to fish it deeper, I could use suspend dots. What's a suspend dot? Well, that was my question. I had never heard of him. I, I didn't know if he was making something up. So when I got home, I looked him up and I bought a pack. Suspend dots are made by Storm. They're removable adhesive weights to alter lure buoyancy and action. They're made of lead. The pack has 80 flat lead dots in it with adhesive on the back. So you can use a whole dot or you can cut them up before sticking them on a lure. So with a small Suic Thriller, you could easily attach one or more if you wanted to fish it deeper. You know, I've kind of heard of those and I've looked them up and that's a pretty interesting thing. Of course, my trip is to stay away from lead. So here's the thing that I've heard of folks using. I've heard of fishers using tungsten tuning tape. Besides an exercise in alliteration, what is tungsten tuning tape? That's something else I haven't heard of. They are adhesive strips of tungsten alloy that are used to balance or increase the weight of a tennis racket. And so, of course, since fishers love to hack into every other sport or hobby out there looking for help, we got folks swiping the tennis tuning tape of tungsten from the racket bag and moving it to the fishing kit. John, you know me. As soon as I got the suspend dots, I thought, what if I want a sinking lure to float more? Just the opposite of adding weight to it. Well, I found a bag of these thin foam stickers on eBay. And I'm thinking I may be able to attach them to a sinking lure to get it to rise up a little bit in the water column. For example, could you add a foam disc to a sinking crankbait and get it to suspend? Or could you add one to either side of a jig head to get it to sink more slowly? I haven't tested them yet, but I wonder, what do you think of that idea of adding foam to a lure? Oh, I think it's a pretty cool idea. I mean, of course, I'm not, I don't want to break you down, brother, but you know, I'm going to kind of think this through here. Um, I have a feeling you're going to have better luck with the slow sinking or neutral lure in the hard bait category than you are with a jig. A metal headed jig has almost zero buoyancy, whereas the hard bait has some lift and, and more water displacement, if you can kind of see what I mean. And whatever you're going to want to stick to it to try to, you know, make it float or try to make it do this or that, you're going to want something kind of dense like EVA something that's, and something that's totally hydrophobic. Um, that's my thing about, you know, a little adhesive foam thing is that if the foam itself, the material absorbs water, then that's completely self-defeating. And if it's an open kind of a foam um, where the air bubbles can escape, uh, it's not going to work as well because even though the porous material is not actually absorbing water, the little air in the little individual cells has gotten replaced with water. And so there's no more buoyancy to it after that. It's kind of the same mechanism like when you start out with a dry fly, you kind of get both. You put a coating on it to keep it hydrophobic, but eventually that coating wears off. Those feathers can't stay in that surface tension and it starts sinking a little lower, a little lower. And then eventually... Um, even any little suspended air in, in the body material and the dubbing and anything else that's been helping it to uh, stay up, all that stuff's gone. And now your dry fly is sinking and you've got to either dry it off or replace it. I think you're going to have some fun messing with this. I really, really do. But I would start off with your hard baits. So what does hydrophobic mean? It means repels water. So um, just um, any material that, that would like when you put uh, rain X on your window and it beads the water up and makes it roll off rather than smear all around that's a hydrophobic substance and so like a dry fly dip that you use when you're out on a stream it'll do that exact same thing make the water beat up on the fly until you know it eventually wears off especially if you're catching fish but it can help keep that dry up there uh, where it should be so my mind was blown by the suspend dots i just need a name for when i launch my own brand of foam lure dots Do you, any any ideas what should we name it oh let's see i think we can come up with something can't we lucy how about drift discs hover hoops glide globes wafting wafers how about tim tackle box beats buoyant bodies well, you know what? That's pretty awesome. It could be a lure modification or an exercise video, but either way, that name has a nice ring to it. <laughs> now I just have to test them to see what works and what doesn't. So, John, you were working on a huge order for from Glasswater Angling. Did you ever finish that up? Oh, yeah, I finally finished it, man. Even in spite of COVID and all the rest of it, I made it through. I got 1,001 jigs tied for the Hackensack, Minnesota Children's Fishing Contest, and I got them sent off yesterday. And I was 83 and a third dozen jigs. Man, that is a lot of jigs. 
yeah, it was a real pleasure to do. They're great people, but yeah, I was tired. I'm tired, tired, tired. I'm not the world's fastest tires. And when you put in sorting materials and all that, and this year I, I'm not really digging the jig heads I've been getting from my casting company. So I've kind of dropped that from uh, what I order from them and I make all my own now. So I had to make and paint all my own jig heads this time around. And that added to it, but I tell you, it's worth it. It's fantastic. It's a great cause. I'm, I'm so glad that these organizations are switching to lead free. It's a real pleasure uh, to work with those folks up there in Hackensack. Well, especially for a kid's tournament, that's a great way to start them off and with uh, non-lead baits so that they can learn about the environmental impact and get them into some baits that are definitely going to hook some fish at the same time. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And they're learning up there. They, they, uh, cause it is a kid's event last year. They ordered some 30 seconds, some 16, some eight ounce this year, all 30 second. And I had a feeling that maybe the kids that got those 30 second ounce jigs just went straight down, started wailing on the fish. Whereas the kid, you know, with the eight ounce, you know, you had to wait for a, you know, a bass or something to kind of come along where, so this year, all 30 second, baby, just, you know, get them down there, get them catching. So it's great. Now, John, what's that over your shoulder in the background? No, that's my do-it-yourself paint box. And I've got some, uh, what I call my Smalley Dooler prototype heads in there. I came across some heads that I had done. I painted using a candle, which they, you know, uh, using a candle to heat the jig head is, is something you can get by in a pinch, but it's really not the best way to do it because you tend to either underheat, overheat, this kind of stuff, or you scorch the paint and this kind of stuff. So these heads had some issues. And it was one of those projects that I just been wanting to get back to, get back to, get back to. But this spring, I did so well on the Smalley Dooler. It's a slightly heavier, it's a three sixteenths bait with a heavier hook in it than the Crappie Dooler. And I'd use that Smalley Dooler Proto on those wipers. And I'm thinking, man, I got to get, you know, build some more of these darn things. So I got in this box full of stuff and I found all these and I took and uh, put eyeballs on them. I like to put bubble eyes on them. And then I took out my um, nail polish. Since I'm going to coat them in vinyl, you can see they got little stripes and little spots and little this, little that going on with them. So that was something just to kind of one of those projects that's been kind of hanging on some back corner of my mind. And I was really glad to get them out, get them painted up, get them vinyled and get them ready to have tails and, and to get out and get people testing them. What, what you, you see one back there you want? Yeah, I want all of them. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, brother? I got, I got a nice uh, green pumpkin here with some red highlights in it. I love that one. I had that one in mind for you. I got a nice uh, gray one. And then of course I got you a chartreuse. Well, you, you tell me you want the, the chartreuse with John Deere green, or do you want the chartreuse with black chartreuse and black? You got it, brother. You got it. All right. And John, you recently sent me some hematite slick weights. Tell the listeners about those. I had never seen these before. Well, we came up with this idea because we we're looking for alternative metals. You know, hematite is a type of iron ore, and it's called hematite because originally it's red, but once it's refined, it becomes more of a natural kind of a gray color. Um, its most recognizable use for most people is in jewelry beads. Uh, it, it can be cast as a metal bead, and then it's treated and polished to a high shine. It takes electroplate very, very well, and therefore it can come in a wide variety of really cool colors, and they can even be painted. Hematite jewelry had its first heyday of popularity back in the 1890s. So I guess it doesn't rust. Do you think a fashionable lady from the turn of the century would have jewelry that would leave rust spots on her skin and clothes? No, certainly not. They were a lot more sweaty back in those days due to the lack of air conditioning. You're right. It had to have been a major consideration for jewelry makers. Oh, yeah, they don't rust. I've been using them for years. Never a problem. So let me conjecture on how you started using hematite beads. I'm thinking your love of shiny objects collided with the band, Black Sabbath, and some subsequent theft from Kathy's jewelry collection. Am I correct? Wow, Lucy, that is so right on. Actually, it's true. I was listening to the album Paranoid and I was pondering alternative metals for weights and you know my whole green company trip is that i want to do something for humankind i see but instead of traveling time and returning as a psychopathic killer robot that slaughters the ungrateful people of a futuristic earth you remembered how pretty kathy is in her hematite teardrop necklace well, yeah 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 some some like that i mean 
See, the song Iron Man made me think of iron, which has a specific gravity right around the same as 10, somewhere between 7.5, 7.8, depending on how it's refined and what you're doing with it. And I knew the earth is like 35% iron, so the stuff is definitely around. And then I did. I did. I thought of Kathy's necklace, and I remembered it was so shiny. And then the teardrops, they reminded me of bullet weights. And as I gazed upon that necklace made of good fishing sinker material, I knew I had lucked into the most beautiful woman on the planet. And so when she wasn't wearing it, I borrowed a few beads off of it. Look, I just slipped them off. And then I tied the string back. I, I don't think she even noticed. Didn't notice a few beads. Kathy says her 18 inch teardrop swag became a choker that wouldn't even fit on the cat. Hey, our cat has a fat neck. Wait a minute anyway, Lucy. Wait, wait, you talk to Kathy now? We've established a bit of sisterhood ever since the Valentine's show. We ring each other up whenever we need to take a break from a mutual problem. But why slick weights? Well, first I was going to call them Iron Man weights because of the song or then, you know, Iron Knight to keep up with that sort of medieval fantasy theme we runs through all our branding, you know, Angle King and Crappie Dooler and, you know, Little Duke Spinners and all, but... However, you know, after dropping them about 20 times and going, dang, these weights sure are slick. 21st time I had me an epiphany. 20 times, huh? Yeah, I mean, at least 20 times. Anyhow, the same high polish that makes them hard to hang on to is the same high polish that really does help move through the weeds. I mean, even the tungsten people are now putting the same type of finishes on some of their products. It not only makes for a decorative shine, a fish attracting shine, but it really does help them to shed weeds and moss better. And like tungsten, hematite is hard. It clicks on rocks and such, and the line holes will not distort the way lead can. Ever notice how polish and polish are spelled the same? Uh, yeah, that has crossed my mind in a weird way a time or two. Do you like Polish sausage? Oh, man, I love it. There's a little place downtown where we could get. Oh, no, you don't. You guys are getting that far away look in your eyes. Warning, deli food distraction in progress. Get back on track, gentlemen. We have a podcast to finish, and I want to hear Tim's hack. Oh, so you have taken them out and tried them then? Yes, but not in the way you expected. Oh, man, I'm loving this. What did you do with them? Last year, we did a lot of testing with Z-Man Elastec soft baits, which aren't like typical Plastisol soft baits at all. Elastec has that more rubbery consistency, and it stretches like crazy. It's so durable and stretchy that you can do things with it that you might not do with Plastisol baits. Oh, yeah, like you like to hook it up right through the nose there with a mosquito hook, right? Exactly. Elastec doesn't easily let go of the hook, so you don't lose baits when you nose hook them the way you do with traditional Plastisol. When I used to fish Plastisol baits, I didn't like to nose hook them because they would often rip right out when a fish tried to take it but didn't get the hook. Wow, I agree with you there. I mean, it was just, just fatal. You're just clipping it, clipping it, clipping it, clipping it down, trying to get into fresh plastic constantly. But anyway, tell me, tell me, tell me, you came up with a way to fish a last tech with my hematite slick weights. Let's hear it. And what made me think of it was our conversation about weedless lures in a recent episode. The same way I don't like to nose hook plastisol baits, I also don't like to use nail weights with them because of losing them when the bait breaks or tears. Some people will glue in their nail weights or they melt the plastic around them, but that just seems like a lot of work to me. A nail weight is a weight that is inserted in the back end of a soft bait and is not attached to the hook or line, only to the bait itself. Sometimes nail weights look just like a carpentry nail, and other times they have an additional weight attached to them. Okay, so Z-Man does make their own nail weights though, right? Z-Man makes an easy-to-rig nail weight for Elastic soft baits. It's called the Neko Shroom Z. It comes in 1 20th, 1 15th ounce, 1 10th, and 1 6th ounce weight sizes. And the weight looks like a mushroom jig head with a stainless centering pin on it. And you push that pin into the bottom of your elastic bait. And there's a plastic pronged piece attached to the pin that grips the bait so that the pin doesn't pull out. Okay, so how do they work? They work great. With a stick bait, they cast like a missile because it's that weight first. And because the weight is the same diameter as the bait, they don't easily snag and you really feel your bait in the water in a different way. You can feel every bump because the weight is the last thing at the end of the line. Wow. This is so great, but come on, man. 
what does this all have to do with hematite slick weights? The only thing I don't like about the Z-Man Neko Shroom Z is the price. The weights come in a four pack for five bucks. So they're a dollar 25 each. That seemed like a lot to me. And when I saw the slick weights you sent me, I had an idea. And for once, it was a good idea. Not like your idea for the tuna and whipped cream sandwich. Or the time you thought it was a good idea to try to juggle eggs. Or the time. Okay, I get it. I get it. But this was a good idea. Maybe a great idea. I took a piece of wire similar to the pin used in the Z-Man nail weight. I bent the wire at one end into a hook shape, kind of like the top of a candy cane. Then I put some super glue at the other end, and I slipped the hematite slick weight on the end. Elastic is so rubbery, I figured when you push the hook end into the bait, the elastic material would kind of fill back in around it, and it would keep the weight in place. All right, this is awesome. My mind has taken flight. I mean, I'm going to be interested, first of all, in seeing how long that super glue holds up. I mean, for the short run, it seems the right way to go because you don't want any kind of wire or anything sticking out of that weight at the bottom out of this Neko rig that you're coming up with. Um, you know, but I still always worry about the longevity of super glue. Um, anyhow, that's one consideration. Okay, so I'm kind of thinking of it this way. A 0. 0.040 MIG wire is right at one millimeter. So since a lot of the bead holes are around 0.9 millimeter, one millimeter up to two millimeters, maybe we could get a wire diameter where you'd get some friction fit to help that glue along and to help things stay together. Before we go off to make Tim the rich and famous Neko rig prints, I have one question. How did it work? It worked great, Lucy. And a lot of the things that John talked about are things that I looked at. I considered having that wire come out of the end and bending it would have made it more secure, but I really wanted to try to go for weedless so that there was really nothing there. And I could really push that weight into the elastic bait. I did have to make one significant modification though. When I inserted the hook into the bait, once it was in all the way, I twisted it about a quarter turn and then I tugged on the weight. And this repositioned the hook into a new part of the bait and then pulled the hook part directly into the elastic. Once I figured that out, there was really no way this nail weight was ever going to come out of the bait. It's one of the only things I found that you could actually tear elastic because I tried to pull one out and you really had to work on it that you might have a problem, John, with the super glue coming undone eventually or something like that. But that hook was really staying in that bait for good. Pod bro, I love this hack like nothing else. And I cannot wait to try it. I mean, I've never really fished an echo rig, but dude, this is so about to change. I mean, I might get myself on down to the test pond today. It's a new favorite way to fish elastic. I wouldn't use it with my regular plastisol baits because it would definitely tear them. In fact, I tried it with a plastisol bait just to see, and it was a mess. It tore it way too much just even going in. But with elastic, it worked like a dream. So if we were to get started cranking these weights out, what would our cost be? Well, let's see, Lucy, I'm telling you, it's all about quantity, all right? I mean, you want to buy as many components as you can to get a good price, but you don't want to have a whole bunch of money tied up in stock and inventory for too long. Of course, in the current economic environment, one tends to overorder because resupply is not a given to the degree that it used to be. So I think I'd probably have to start off with the wire company. I put in probably order for like 10,000 other pins. Whoa, 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 whoa. 10,000 weights? You know, I'm, I don't need 10,000 of these weights. What would it cost our listeners to buy the basics to make like a few dozen of these in two or three sizes? All right, all right, all right. I'm, I got carried away. I can't help it. But anyway, here's what you're going to do. You're going to go get yourself some, a couple sizes of stainless steel wire, maybe get yourself a 0 0.040 and a 0 0.035, something in there. And you can find that a lot of your big hardware stores. Uh, you can find them at the Ace Hardware stores sometimes. You can also go to LureParts.com, Barlow's, Jans, any of these outfits that sell lure building components. And they're going to have coil wire, coil MIG wire, and all kinds of sizes. Um, yeah, I mean, this is the same wire that you use, for example, to make a spinner shaft or to make wire lure forms and such like that. So it's pretty inexpensive to outright cheap, depending on where and how much you buy, Okay. So let's just say the piece you would use to make one of these weights would cost, oh, I don't know, one to five cents. So, and then your beads, they're anywhere from five to 40 cents each, once again, depending on where or how one buys them and in what sizes and colors. 
Like I put in a link for a supplier I've used before called Jenny Sun, and she sells sell you a strand of six by twelve millimeter hematite teardrops for two eighty nine a strand, which is about thirty five beads. That puts you at eight point five cents for each bead list price, but then you got to figure in your shipping. So let's say it's ten cents for the bead, two cents for the wire, and two cents worth of super glue. You've got yourself a snazzy Neko weight Tim Tackle Box beat style for fourteen. That's simply tremendous. Warning, warning, Lure News Alert, Lure News Alert. Hey everybody, Lure Love Podcast co-host Tim Tacklebox Beat won two awards in the Outdoor Writers Association of America Annual Excellence in Craft Competition. Mr. Beat won first place and third place in the blog humor category for his essays on the Lure Love Podcast website. The winning essays included deer in a kayak my personal favorite and minimalist fishing and bull sharks it was the first year he had entered the competition tim beat was quoted as saying hey let me say it let me say it the owa has some of the best outdoor writers in the nation so i was thrilled to be among the winners plus the prize money means i'm off to the tackle shop to buy more gear our motto on the lure love podcast is why buy one lure when you can buy 103? And I intend to live up to that. So cool. This year's OWAA contest had more than 645 entries and was sponsored with support from Friesen's Publishing, Henry Repeating Arms, Isaac Walton League, Pew Charitable Trusts, and the Recreational Boating and Fishing Foundation. The complete list of winners can be found on the OWAA website at OWAA.org. Congratulations, Pod Bro! Thanks, buddy. I am so stoked that I crushed the competition like the fishing rod I left in the driveway and backed over with my car. In fact, I'm so excited that I'm going to sing that song, Everyone's a Winner, just like I did a few episodes ago. But this time, I found an extended version, which is a full eight minutes long. Oh, dear. I cannot let this happen. Wait a minute, Lucy. I can't hear Tim singing. You say that like it's a bad thing. Oh, 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 oh I'm not complaining. I, I, that was just an observation. I muted his mic. He's singing his little heart out, but thankfully, we don't have to listen. So we have like seven minutes to kill, huh? You are correct, sir. Should I read you an inventory of all the lures in your collection? Ah, no thanks. I've memorized those. Why don't you play that old recording of Tim reading one of his winning essays? He is so great at writing, I'm telling you. Singing, uh, you know, maybe a little work there. Great idea. Let me cue up his winning essay from the archives. Here it is. At a circus, I once saw a chimpanzee on a tricycle. And on YouTube, I've seen a dog on a skateboard and a squirrel on water skis. But those pale in comparison to what I saw last weekend while fishing. It was a deer in a kayak. I often see deer when fishing on this particular river, and I see a lot of kayaks on the river too. But this was the first time I had ever seen them combined. As I looked upstream, I could see the kayak come round the bend. At that distance, everything looked pretty normal. Just another yakker coming to disrupt my fishing. It was a common occurrence, and the kayak didn't seem to be in a hurry as it slowly floated downstream. But as the kayak got closer, I noticed two things. First, the kayaker wasn't holding a paddle. Second, the kayaker had the skinniest arms I had ever seen. And as it got still closer, I thought, that guy has the largest ears I've ever seen. And as the kayak got even closer, I thought, that guy looks like an Odicolius virginianus, a white-tailed deer. I rubbed my eyes and looked again. I was fishing for catfish in a few of the deeper holes in the river and thought the new bait I was testing might be clouding my brain. The bait was a large container of catfish dip that should have included a gas mask with every container. The instructions even said not to let the dip come in contact with your skin. When I opened the container and looked inside, I knew immediately that putting my nose directly over the dip was a colossal mistake. It was like being punched in the face with an angry skunk that had just finished eating a dozen rotten eggs and rolling in cow manure. 
As a kid, I'd heard of a practical joke where you put dog poop in a paper bag, place it on someone's porch, light the bag on fire, ring the doorbell, and run. When the homeowner sees the burning bag and stomps out the flames, their shoe gets covered with dog poop. I'm not saying this is a classy practical joke to pull on someone, and I don't even know if anyone actually ever tried it. It might have been one of those tales told by kids who always credit the story to their out-of-town cousin's classmate's older brother or some other inaccessible person who can't corroborate the story. But after getting a strong right uppercut of catfish dip in both nostrils, I realized the practical joke would have been much more effective if the dog poop was replaced with catfish dip. The only problem would be that the homeowners would have to throw away their shoes and possibly tear down their porch to get rid of the smell. But back to the deer in the kayak. What had fooled me at first was that the deer was sitting upright in the kayak seat, like a person, with its hind legs in the kayak, its head held high in the air, and its front legs hanging in front of it. I knew it was hunting season, and often saw deer crossing the river and in the woods. As the kayak came close, I could also see that in the deer's lap, if deer have laps, was a bow. The deer was clearly dead but its open eyes eerily stared straight ahead. This opportunity was too good to be true. No, I wasn't going to take the deer, but where there's a deer in a kayak, there's likely to be a frantic hunter upstream trying to catch up with it, and I was going to enjoy our conversation as much as possible. Knowing the river well, I could tell the kayak would beach itself around the next bend, so I let it continue on its way and listen for sounds coming downstream. It wasn't long before I could hear someone crashing through the shallows at the edge of the river. I would say the hunter was cursing like a sailor, but the cursing was much more like someone who had lost his kayak, deer, and bow. I just casually continued fishing. When he got close, he stopped, caught his breath, and asked, Did you see a kayak come by here? Yeah, I said casually. About a dozen kayaks have come by this morning. This one had a deer in it, he said expectantly. A deer, I said, scratching my head. Yeah, he said, a deer. What color was the kayak, I asked. What color was the kayak, he stammered. What difference does the color of the kayak make? It had a deer in it. Well, I said, quite a few kayaks have come down the river today, just trying to narrow it down. Did you know the deer? What do you mean, did I know the deer, he said, getting angry. I shot it. What did you shoot it with, I asked. A bow, he said, getting exasperated with me. But you don't have a bow, I said. His mouth opened and then closed for a second. The deer has the bow in the kayak, he said sheepishly. Well, why didn't you say that at the beginning, I said, as if we were getting somewhere. I did see a deer go by in a kayak with a bow, but I don't think it's the one you're looking for. What do you mean, he asked. Well, the deer that came by sitting in the kayak with a bow was dead, and I think it was a self-inflicted wound. Self-inflicted, he asked? Well, deer don't take hunting safety classes, and my guess is he didn't know how to handle the bow and shot himself, poor guy. I shot him. He didn't shoot himself, the hunter said defensively. Well, there's really no way to know for sure, since there weren't any witnesses. I was a witness. I shot it, he countered. It's just your word against the word of the dead deer, and I don't think that's going to hold up in a court of law. Where's my kayak now, he asked. It went around the bend. It probably beached itself there. Why didn't you stop it from going downstream, he asked in desperation. Well, first, I don't usually talk to kayakers who go past here, and I didn't want to get into some big conversation with a deer while I was fishing. And second, when the game warden showed up, I'm not sure he'd believe that I found the deer, dead, sitting in the kayak with a bow and me with no hunting license. Well, you do have a point there, he said. Yeah, I've watched enough episodes of Northwood's Law to know not to be caught with a dead deer in a kayak. What happened, I asked him. He shook his head. I used the kayak to get to that island upstream. That way I left no scent getting there. Within 15 minutes, I saw the deer and shot it. My plan was to put the deer in the kayak and float it down to the next bridge to take it out. I tried tying the deer to the kayak, but the deer kept falling over the edge, so I tied it into the seat. But while I was taking a leak, the kayak got away from me. If I had a dollar for every time I've heard that story, I said. Well, you better go get your kayak and deer, and try to be more careful next time.
I heard the phrase, try to be more careful next time, a lot growing up, and I found it coming out of my mouth without my knowledge. If I'd been on the Titanic, I probably would have said it to the captain as the ship was sinking. Try to be more careful next time. I'd say seeing the deer in the kayak was even better than the squirrel on water skis. My only regret is that I forgot to tell the hunter that had left him a present in one of the dry storage compartments of his kayak. I knew he was having a bad day and wanted to cheer him up. Besides, I was done with using my catfish dip bait and thought he might like to try it. I sure hope he finds it before next summer. Okay, Tim's song is almost done. Let me turn his mic back on. Fail to satisfy, satisfy. Wow, I really belted out that song. I have got some pipes. It was the best song I've never heard. Did you say never heard? Oh, I think what Lucy said was that was the best song, you clever bird. Clever bird? You use some strange phrases. I recently saw a Facebook ad for a unique lure. It's called the original number two corn-eyed brown trout. Uh, John, that looks just like a... The advertising copy reads, are you or a friend one of those people who can't get a bite no matter how good the fishing is around you? Why not try something a little different than those old, worn-out, traditional fishing lures? Introducing the original number two corn eyes brown trout fishing lure. John, that lure definitely looks just like a... Whether you're fishing on a lake, in a river, or downstream from the county wastewater treatment facility, this custom-made fishing lure will be a hit with all your fishing buddies. The old number two was pinched off at four inches long and comes with three number two size treble hooks. It would also look stunning when proudly attached to the band of your favorite fishing hat. I am not putting that on my hat. This lure is designed and painted to bring out the details that leave no question as to what it is. This ain't no Tootsie Roll, that's for sure. I have no question what it is. It's brown and has pieces of corn in it. Plus, there's even a fly on it. Oh, that added fly lets you know how fresh the old stink loaf is. And adds a level of realism that serious lure lovers will recognize and appreciate. No matter if you're fishing for crappies, carp, or bass, the original number two corn eyes brown trout will set you apart from all the other anglers. It will keep other anglers from approaching you is more likely. Each lure is $12 and can be ordered on Facebook. That's some pretty expensive crap. And we'll drop a link in the show notes. I guess we'll be dropping a deuce in the show notes then. (laughs) After that news story, I'm sure our 10-year-old boy listener demographic will go through the roof. That's it for another episode of the Lore Love Podcast. Make sure to visit our website at www.lorelovepodcast.com and sign up for our email newsletter, which automatically enters you to win a fine selection of glasswater angling lures. And don't forget the Lore Love motto. Why buy one lure when you can buy 103? Lure love, you've been on my mind. Never enough lures to tie to the end of my line. Lure love, can't I make you see? Why buy five lures when you can buy 103?